So um, I spoke with Lyra yesterday because um, typically when I've been presenting, I've been presenting on what the clubhouse model is. But being that this is a clubhouse, I don't have to do that. That's awesome. Um, so instead, I really just wanted to talk about what the vision for Clubhouse Oregon is and what we envision happening with Clubhouse Oregon. So um, Bill is actually on the board for Clubhouse Oregon, so him and I get to work together on that. And one of the other things that we're also hoping is that we can identify some North Star members that would also like to serve on the Clubhouse Oregon board. Um, because really, it, when you are developing a state coalition for clubhouses, you want clubhouses to be in the driver's seat of that coalition. Um, so Clubhouse Oregon, if you look at the handouts that I did, we're, the vision for Clubhouse Oregon is really to help spread and promote the Clubhouse model throughout the state of Oregon. This is a, a relatively new model to the state of Oregon itself, um, meaning that there are only two existing Clubhouses operating here, and those are North Star and then also Compass House down in Medford, Oregon. Um, but we're currently working with other groups in different areas. We have a startup group in Klamath County. Um, we actually just presented over there on Saturday at their March for Hope. We also have another group um, developing in Lincoln County that is working to establish a clubhouse there over on the Oregon coast. And then also we're in discussions with both um, Lane County and Curry County. And from what I understand, possibly Washington County through Luke Dorf um, is looking at developing a clubhouse over there. So the goal of Clubhouse Oregon is to really try to help facilitate the spread of the Clubhouse model throughout the state of Oregon. And the reason why mo a lot of states that have Clubhouses develop statewide coalitions is because we need a voice that can kind of centralize the needs for Clubhouses in a particular state or the needs to develop Clubhouses in a state. And so having a central organizing body within the state of Oregon could help with legis legislative advocacy, can help with technical support to new clubhouses or ongoing technical support to existing clubhouses. And really, it's a way of helping establish a statewide network of clubhouses, much like we have with the international community through Clubhouse International, but more at a local level within the state that can deal with specific issues that people in Oregon are dealing with um, in terms of clubhouses and also in terms of the issues that members deal with that attend the clubhouses in Oregon. And, you know, I would also really entertain, love questions. So is there anybody that has any questions? And I can repeat them into this so that we can also have them um, answered on the YouTube channel. Yes? Uh, well, I was going to have a question, but I suppose the bigger we get, the more um, the screen out there, the, the grant possibilities increase. Uh, Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the key pieces with being able to organize with an entity like Clubhouse Oregon is it does give us a venue for promoting more awareness about the Clubhouse model, which also opens up more avenues for Clubhouses throughout the state to be able to get funding from local funders. Um, in fact, part of my work with Klamath County is also providing them information that I've written for grants for, um, for Compass House down in Medford and being able to help them um, articulate those grants for based on successful proposals that I've done. So any kind of awareness that we can do is always helpful. Yes? Um, do you have uh, good relations or are you making good relations with the state representatives and county leaders and stuff like that? Is that part of what's going on with your Absolutely. Um, I know that based in Jackson County, um, I can speak to that, that as far as our, the relationship down there between the clubhouse and the county, it's very strong. Um, the county is one of the major funders of um, Compass House down in Medford, Oregon. Um, Bill could probably speak a little bit more to the relationship between um, North Star and Multnomah County. Um, but um, yes, I do envision that Clubhouse Oregon can also help facilitate um, the development of relationships especially in areas where there's startup groups that want to get a clubhouse going, but they don't necessarily have relationships with their CCOs and with their county officials. What we could then do is then step in to be able to show evidence um, for why this model is, is works, but then also um, trying to help them network into their own communities um, and identifying the funders that they need to have at the table to help push those conversations forward. And the biggest piece to this is getting sustainable revenue for clubhouses in Oregon. Um, grant funding is great, but it runs out, and eventually grant funders want um, organizations to have sustainable revenue coming in. 
and that comes in the form of contracts for services that clubhouses do. And, um, and, but in the state of Oregon, there's no defined mechanism for funding clubhouses. Each region is going to be different. The funding revenues for Compass House down in Medford are much different than what they are for North Star up here in Multnomah County. And the reason for that is because each community is unique and each funder in the community because of the CCOs have flexibility with being able for how they're able to get funding to their clubhouses. So it would be nice if we could identify some formal mechanism that shows that um, that that requires each community to fund clubhouses and to fund startups in their communities. But that doesn't exist yet. So part of what we have to do in doing this is also try to work to create something like that. And each com we can find funding in each community, but the uniformity has to come from the state. Yes? What is some of the funding? Under the people that come in the clubhouses? Well, in Oregon, I know that um, North Star has had a block grant um, from the state of Oregon. And I do, I do believe that North Star also has some funding coming from the county, correct? So down in Medford, what we were able to do was establish a contract with our county itself, and then also outside of that, we also established CCO contracts with All Care. And um, so the contractual revenue looks very similar, but ours primarily has down in Medford has primarily come from the county, and then also um, the CCOs that we partner with. Um, ide ideally, what I would like to get to is where um, the state will open up funding for help, like with. with employment and those kind of things so that we can have direct funding streams coming from the state of Oregon because um, I envision that the counties and CCOs are always going to have a part and they should have a part in helping fund their clubhouses but I would like to at least cr help create some direct revenue coming from the state to support the employment efforts that clubhouses do um, we got one over here then Bill uh, yeah. what are the ideas What can the clubhouses offer to be to earn, you know, to, to earn the revenue? So that's a great question. I actually have a breakdown um, that Clubhouse International did of um, services that clubhouses naturally provide that are also based on clubhouse standards um, that are billable through um, CMS, which is a center for Medicaid. Um, so things like supported employment things like transitional employment, things um, like reach out or helping members um, gain access to services in the community, the type of advocacy work that clubhouses do. So there's a variety of different things that clubhouses do that is technically billable um, that needs to be identified as clubhouse services that the state will recognize and award. Bill? It's kind of hard to get your mind wrapped around <laughs>
a big hearing before the senators there to, to build, talk up our law and have them pass it. And it was a lot of fun. Clubs throughout the, the state came to uh, Olympia and made the big march on the Capitol, and we were able to get this law passed. Yeah. So it really can be a lot of fun, too. So the clubhouse is working and it's very successful. At the, at the time, they were very successful because as you added up the membership and all the different um, clubs, there was a lot of people getting services from clubs, and and that made it a difference to the legislature in Washington. Yes. So a couple of times you said at the time. So how long have the clubhouse been around? Yeah, at the time, <laughs> well, it's been a while ago. The clubs have been kind of struggling, and this is pretty been true nationally that, that different uh, at different times there's more funding for clubs or there's more interest in clubs um, than other times in almost all states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things um, in terms of that is a lot of clubhouses are auspiced through larger mental health organizations, which means like kind of like the relationship between North Star and Lukedorf. Um, and Oftentimes in clubhouses that have that type of relationship that are also um, pretty much an entity that's under the control of an auspice organization, when there's more money in day treatment or something else, oftentimes other clubs in other areas have been converted in away from being a clubhouse in order to, for their auspice organization to obtain more revenue for the services that are being done there. And so that's one of the issues that um, clubhouses have um, ran into in different areas. And I believe in Washington, one of the issues was is that the state did re um, recognize the clubhouse model and even came up with their own form of accreditation for clubhouses within the state of Washington. But I don't believe they ever actually put anything monetary into that. <laughs> I didn't want to add that. <laughs> and, um, and so... Obviously, in Oregon, what we want to be able to accomplish is not only getting the state to fully recognize the clubhouse model, but also to have the state recognize and allocate money for clubhouses um, to be able to provide services. And my dream is actually would be for the state to actually carve out money away from anything mental health um, to give clubhouses direct funding so that we don't have to deal with the regulations that rub up against the clubhouse model for billing of Medicaid and those kind of things. Yeah. Yes. Um, so in the state of Oregon in particular, if a clubhouse were to um, get the certification to be able to bill Medicaid directly themselves, the clinical requirements that the state places um, to be able to do that actually would, in my opinion, compromise the integrity of the clubhouse model. Um, over here then, Bill. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, what kind of evidence exists now of the validity of the clubhouse model, and could Clubhouse Oregon, would they be interested in creating more evidence on the population within Oregon? Yes, we would. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, Clubhouse International has actually published um, um, different studies that have been done on um, the efficacy of the clubhouse model. Um, internally, uh, me and Lyra were actually just talking about this um, just yesterday, actually, with, um, and Bill and I have had conversations about this in the past, where what we wanted to do was create, between the clubhouses in Oregon, was track similar da data measurements so that we could, um, each clubhouse could individually pr produce an annual report, but then statewide we could then combine all of the reports to show the effects of the clubhouses in Oregon across the entire state. And one thing that I wanted to um, mention was down in Southern Oregon, we have a medical provider named Asante. They um, operate the only behavioral health unit that we have in Southern Oregon. And so that unit serves se about seven different counties um, and only has about 20 beds. So it's always, it's always full. Um, but the first year that, Club, that Compass House opened down in Southern Oregon, the readmission rate into the behavioral health unit at Asante was um, tw at 
When we first opened, we were every week we would go in and our members would do would present and tell their story and talk about the benefit of being a part of the clubhouse. After our first year of operating down there, um, the readmission rate went from 24% to 17%. And um, a lot of that um, is kind of is tied to the work that Compass House was doing down there. And so it's those types of things that collectively across the state we want to be able to show the impact because that 7% that seven drop um, creates a savings in the six figures for, for the larger medical providers. So what we want to be able to do is be able to showcase those kind of things, um, to be able to show the cost effectiveness of, being a of having a clubhouse operating in a community, and then also um, the impact that it has on the individual lives of our members. They, they have, um, I haven't been there in a couple months, but they um, are to the point where they're beginning to become less dependent on grants and more dependent on the contracts for the services that are be being provided. And they actually worked out, a, we worked out a pretty interesting deal to where we get Medicaid as block grant dollars, um, to where each quarter we get a, they get a, um, a, a large lump sum payment. And what we then do is we provide data um, back to that ba for the services that the clubhouse has done. And the way that we were able to track that is we actually um, brought in clubhouse database software from Massachusetts called Appalistic, and which is a software program that's fairly affordable that um, tracks clubhouse data. And so what we would do is as we operate, we track attendance, we would track um, reach out calls, we would track any number of things that we're doing as a clubhouse. And then we would pull those data reports and then just create a comprehensive summary of each quarter and then in turn um, send that into the funders to satisfy their needs to be able to show that they're investing in something that's working. Yes. No, so um, they are a freestanding clubhouse. Not necessarily. Um, you know, there's a lot of very, very strong clubhouses that have very, very good relationships with their hospice organizations, and that's turned into be a benefit for them because in times when revenue is down and they're not getting funding, the hospice organization believes in what the clubhouse does and will insulate them and support them. So if you have that type of relationship with an hospice organization, you're probably better off for it. Whereas if you were a freestanding clubhouse, um, that could cause some issues because you don't have that same type of insulation. So I think it, it varies. Always. <laughs> um, always looking for money somewhere. <laughs> Not, not really, not down in Southern Oregon because we had so much support from the community around that. So, um, and so it can't, the Medicaid dollars come directly from the county and also the CCOs, um, which because there's local governance within each of those entities, we're able to have relationships with them and have sit down meetings with them. So it wasn't necessarily that difficult in that situation, um, but also the initiative to start Compass House down in Southern Oregon was initiated by the division manager of Jackson County Mental Health because she came from Utah um, where there are a lot of clubhouses and she worked for Valley Mental Health which is the auspice organization for Alliance House and so when she came in um, she was able to make the county put forward money to support that initiative and as a result of that money for Compass House down in Southern Oregon has been much easier than for a, cl a startup clubhouse that in a community that's never heard of the model. Yes. Hey, I have a question or a conflict in my mind mm -hmm. about, about uh, 
CTO, mm -hmm. banking dollar, to me, it's kind of like a, it's contradictory or goes against Clubhouse now because it reminds me of that you have to do uh, spending for tax stuff. Mm -hmm. It could potentially. Um, it's really going to depend on the setup that you have if you contract with one of your CCOs. Um, and that's part of the reason why with the contracting that we had set up down in Southern Oregon was to where we would we were just doing clubhouse services, um, but we weren't having to do case notes or anything else within the clubhouse or any at all, really. Um, we were just tracking typical clubhouse data such as attendance, such as, um, you know, we even had a we even st started a wellness program and had a kickball team, so we would track um, how many members are participating in that. Um, but the typical things that clubhouses do, helping members find employment, those were the ta data sets that we were supplying to them. So, but rather than doing direct billing on an individual's Medicaid ID number, instead what we were doing was just globally um, showing what the clubhouse has done. Um, and in that sense, it ended up working out pretty well for us because then we didn't have Medicaid regulations coming down on us that would compromise the model. But it can become a sticky situation depending on what each individual CCO is requiring in return for that money. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that there was a lot of community support for the clubhouse model in Southern Oregon. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you wanted to speak a bit about that. that we might be able to learn from that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of it came because the leadership in our community um, was very much in favor of it and, um, in fact, introduced it. Um, and then from that point when um, I was on the county's mental health advisory committee and I became involved in it, um, it really became about once the working group was working towards developing the clubhouse, being in the community, doing presentations, developing relationships with our local media. Um, on the right side for myself is I come from the nonprofit world even before I was ever involved in Clubhouse. So my job at Addictions Recovery Center, I handled their marketing and development. So I brought relationships with me with local media outlets. And so as we were developing um, the Clubhouse down there, we were also making sure that we were on the news, that we were in the newspaper. And that community dialogue was beginning to um, take place. Not, not only to talk about the Clubhouse model, but also to talk about mental illness and the need for more support and more services and the need for less stigma. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bill? Good time to put in a plug for our meeting coming up because Matt is mentioning that, that having that county official in the highest position being supportive of the clubhouse is what a big difference that makes. Mm -hmm. And it does. I mean, if you have somebody in a leadership position who's saying this is a great thing to other people who are working for that person, that really carries a lot of weight. We have David Hidalgo coming here, who is in a very similar position that that woman in Jackson County is in. And if he's not he, if he's not educated now or didn't come from the state or has clubhouse, et cetera, he can be educated. He can mm -hmm. get behind this effort if we all help him learn what it's all about and really help him understand it at a deeper level mm -hmm. than he currently has right now. So that's why it's so important if we can get everybody out that day to come in here and really kind of talk to him about what this is about and how much they support what he needs as a deputy, that's a big, big deal. Absolutely. Yes. The, there's mental health issues seemingly happening almost every day in the media around here in Portland. Yeah. And even, you know, we need some kind of <clears throat> a presence in there all the time, I think, making themselves known to you know, the police, uh, behavior health units, and mental health, more outreach, more present, you know, keeping our name out there all the time to, you know, in the yeah, conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with news is possible. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Any, you know, yeah. in the media context, somehow. Uh, yeah. One of the things that we did for that was we actually developed a position called an, our outreach coordinator. Um, which was actually funded directly by a CCO um, because of the um, just how good it is to have a clubhouse doing reach out to members, but also 
to have a staff that still operated as a generalist but was also bottom line specifically with working with members to go out to the community and present. So we would also, we were, um, part of our community awareness was also presenting in front of different classrooms at Rogue Community College or Southern Oregon University and really just making sure that we were constantly in the community, whether even if it was just a face-to-face -face with somebody, we were still being ambassadors to the clubhouse model and helping spread awareness about the work that the clubhouse can do. Um, and But the biggest difference between us in Southern Oregon and up here in Multnomah County is up here you have a much larger media market. And so it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to establish those contacts. Um, but once it's done, you're in. Um, and you become one of the regulars that they call up when something happens and they would like to run a story that they're gonna ask you questions about. Um, it'll take a little bit longer up in the Portland area um, rather than Southern Oregon where anything can be news. Um, <laughs> um, but it can happen. Yes. So um, down there, they currently have five staff, and average daily attendance approaches about 30 per day, um, with a total membership of getting close to 500. Yes. You mentioned that upper at the top where yes. it's not easy for us to get if we wanted to. Or? Actually, it is. Um, so I could actually send you guys the information on it. Um, so Appalistic Software was actually developed by an individual that moved in next door to a clubhouse over in Massachusetts. Um, was seeing that was looking at their property and noticed that there was a lot of raking and everything else needed to be done. So he wanted to try to contact that clubhouse to try to volunteer for them. And so they ended up bringing him in and letting him kind of volunteer and hang out with the members and do things. And when he was in there, he realized what they didn't need help raking. They needed help tracking data. And so he ended up developing um, an access database called Appalistic, um, which was affordable, but gave something to the clubhouse that allowed them to track traditional clubhouse data sets. Um, and it's actually relatively affordable in many cases too. It's um, anything that you can get for under $5,000 is pretty good when it comes to software for tracking things. But I can definitely um, send you guys the contact information for Jeff over there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of uh, advocacy, uh, legislative action, et cetera. Well, in Washington State, there was 12 clubhouses serving hundreds of people. And those people that were in the clubs themselves, members of the clubs, they didn't particularly care about that kind of activity. They weren't so politically active. They were members of clubs, and they were interested in other things. But the, but the coalition also organized a statewide camp out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the members of all the clubs, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, we actually rented out a whole campground somewhere in the mountains in, in Washington, mm -hmm. different ones each time, and people from all the clubs would come and gather and just have a great time doing camping together, like you know, you go to camp outs and stay in cabins and that sort of stuff. And it was a lot of fun, and, and the coalition organized that whole thing, and that became really well known mm -hmm. to all. They also organized a semi-annual conference that became this big conference mm -hmm. um, on the off year of the international conference. And that was, that became really popular. It went mm -hmm. to a regional conference over time. And that drew clubs from all of the western regions of the United States and, and eventually started drawing clubs from all over because people would want to go to clubhouse conferences on the off year of the international seminar. So that was a very interesting and Um, yeah, Clubhouse International, um, not this last year, but the year before, did the very first U.S. national um, conference. 
And they're doing it again this year in Washington, D.C. And the reason why they're doing it is because um, United States clubhouses face very specific issues in terms of Medicaid and finding funding. And so they wanted to do a conference in the off year from the international conference that could focus solely on issues that U.S. clubhouses face. Um, but um, I know that different state coalitions are still doing, um, like in Utah, they still do an annual clubhouse conference for clubhouses within their state. So I know that that's another thing that we've um, been toying around with, which is once this gets developed, is being able to do something like that. Um, but currently there's only two clubhouses, so currently the idea is, is to get the structure for Clubhouse Oregon in place and provide support to the different startup groups that we have so that we can start getting more clubhouses going. And actually, um, so one of the conversations that I've been having with Lane County that Lyra is now involved in is with a lady named Sheila Thomas, who is the director of Lila, which is a SIL that operates in Lane County. Um, Lila is potentially interested in looking at auspicing a clubhouse through their organization. And so North Star is the clubhouse that she's actually gonna be wanting to set up a tour of. So, um, everybody gets to play a part in that and trying to help inspire her to want to take that back to Lane County and start developing a clubhouse. Have she gotten in touch with you, Lara? Yes, a formal introduction, but yes, I have to Okay. I spoke with her last week. She said that she was going to try to reach out to you this week, so. Um, yes. First of all, uh, is Pumpkin House, are they accredited by international? In the process of, the, um, of doing the self-study right now. I, I think it's kind of de facto at this point you're in. <laughs> but, um, but yes, I do view both North Star and Compass House as, um, as established clubhouses that um, are we're going to be leaned on to help lead this and help lead the development of other clubhouses in different parts of the state. Um, and one of the other things that I would like to see Clubhouse Oregon be able to um, accomplish is once the new startups are beginning to open and everything else is that we also as a as a coalition incentivize um, each clubhouse working towards accreditation and following clubhouse standards because at the end of the day it makes all the clubhouses in Oregon stronger and um, also gives us a more pure standpoint of um, providing clubhouse services and emulating this model to, er, to the state. Um, right here then here. They do. So they do um, an annual event called the Helping Hands Benefit, which um, I don't know if they're going to be incorporating an auction into it, but it's more of a Benevon model type event where there's no ticket charge, but the people that are being invited and hosting tables are well aware that they're going to be asked to give money. And so that is an event that they provide down there. But then also um, the board of directors has continuous efforts to try and build our grassroots donor base. And um, also within the clubhouse, um, getting members involved in donor communications and also asking for funding. Um, that's a constant that they're currently working on and that we were always working on. Um, always trying to build that donor base of grassroots donors so that eventually um, grassroots donors can become major donors in the future. Um, and any nonprofit, that's going to be a consistent thing that you're always trying to do. Well, um, we've, we've had these big, these big annual mm -hmm. uh, things, but I'm you know, as a smaller outreach mm -hmm. fundraiser, the, the, the clubhouse and I have been able to fund on its own since, you know, even lunches or outings or mm -hmm. any number of, op you know, op options mm -hmm. on a smaller level right. to get your yeah um, you know when it came to time for the um, international conference last year we actually had members um, organizing car washes and different things to help um, raise money to be able to help pay for the travel costs of the international conference so um, as f smaller scale things um, doing raffles um, being able to talk to a local business about getting certificates or a hotel stay and then creating raffle tickets then members could sell those to their family members or um, people in the community and um, different small things like that are 
pretty consistently going on and uh, with more frequency. And the key piece with that is it also gives you contact information of the donors that are buying the tickets um, so that you can also create a mail list so that you can then um, keep in contact with those donors too and keep them abreast of what's going on with the clubhouse. Actually, Lyra comes from one um, down in Concord. Um, <laughs> so in my opinion, a successful clubhouse is a clubhouse that has a very, very vibrant work order day with a sense of urgency to it, um, where there is constant member buy-in, where the clubhouse decision making follows as close to consensus building as possible, and where members are going out to the community, where um, members are finding employment, where members are finding housing. I view a successful clubhouse as a clubhouse that is able to follow the model and is also able to show the recovery that is happening as a result of that. And each clubhouse is unique. Um, you know, the standards are fairly fluid in the sense that every community has unique circumstances and each cl clubhouse in each community has to develop to be able to meet the unique needs that their members have in that community. But at the end of the day, I view a successful clubhouse as a very vibrant community center that um, is promoting recovery and helping members move forward in their lives. Now, could you explain the thing you said? You said a work order day with a sense of urgency. Could you describe that? <coughs> so, in my opinion, a sense of urgency within the work order day is where the work has meaning, where the work is needed, where the work is absolutely essential to keep the clubhouse running. It's not just staff writing on a whiteboard. Um, meaningless tasks to help fill time to help keep members busy. It's about the fact that this work that needs to get done, we know that we need to make lunch. We know that we need to have these contract discussions. We know that we need to write these grants. That, And in my opinion, the sense of urgency comes when staff and members truly do have that shared responsibility and everything is placed out there for members to be able to get involved in. Um, and for myself, when I was in, uh, a new director in a startup clubhouse, the hardest part was trying to take the administrative work that I had to get done and get that into the work order day and learn how to take something that might be absolutely terrifying to me and everybody else and then break that down into manageable tasks so that as many people as possible could help us accomplish it. And it took time. It took, it's almost like a science of trying to figure out how to do that. Um, but in my opinion, it's those types of things that make the work order day meaningful because it's real work that is required to keep the clubhouse going forward. Um, you know, so in my opinion, um, urgency is, means real. Um, and, it go, and when there's enough urgent work, reach out calls call from, hey, where you been? I miss you, to, hey, I need you. Can you please come in and help? Um, and it's... It, it tr starts attracting people in. It helps. And it also, the other piece to it is when the work is real and the work is urgent, um, what I've seen firsthand is that members that, um, when they first came to the clubhouse, employment or education was not something that was in their wheelhouse or that they were even willing to attempt. After being engaged in the clubhouse and doing the work in the clubhouse side by side with other members and other staff, they begin to believe in themselves. They begin to see their friends taking that risk and going out on that TE position or enrolling in college or working on their GED. And those members begin um, breaking down their own um, internal stigmas that they have about what their own limitations are. And that's what I believe a vibrant and urgent work order day can do, is it helps break us out of our own molds that we're in and helps us become who we can be. Yes. more of that sense of urgency or we want to get more of our members involved in you know, key activities like grant writing and mm -hmm. other things. Um, do you have any advice on maybe how to generate that and keep that going consistently? So one of the things that we started doing down in Southern Oregon was um, every month, each unit would have a unit planning meeting where we would then um, start going through the work that that unit was bottom line with accomplishing. And we would talk about the tasks, um, such as um, daily social media posts or daily bulletins. 
And um, we would take tasks like that and say, okay, we're having a very hard time getting this done. Is this even something that needs to get done? Does anybody care about this? Or, you know, doing the newsletter, it's not really a one-person job. How do we break this down into different tasks so that more people can get involved in it? And so we began having those kind of discussions and really building the work order day um, as a result of that. But the other side of that is also creating, hey, good to see you again. <laughs> Um, creating buy-in um, from members um, and helping develop and identify what work is meaningful. Um, and that's going to be different from clubhouse to clubhouse, but that was how we began doing that. Yes? Uh, did you find uh, people that were coming out of uh, mental health uh, hospitals or whatever? Was there a period of time where when you said they weren't, the work order day wasn't in the wheelhouse, uh, was there a certain period of time on average that that they just, that you just let, leave them soak it up and until it looked like they were ready or they would step forward to start engaging? Well, with, uh, you know, the key piece is that membership is voluntary and so is participation. Um, but what we did was we created an orientation process where we would take people through um, introducing them to the clubhouse. And part of the orientation process was spending time in each of the units within the clubhouse. Um, and then at the end of that orientation, it would also be explained that, you know, you pick and choose when you come to the clubhouse. You pick and choose what you get involved in at the clubhouse. And so oftentimes when we would have um, members that were coming from an inpatient setting or members that had recently come back to Southern Oregon after coming out of the state hospital, um, where a member might show up but they might not necessarily feel comfortable with getting involved. But that what we would then try to do is just try to make sure that members and staff are there encouraging that member or at whatever level that member is comfortable with talking to that member. Um, you know, a member might not be comfortable going over there and cutting um, celery, but if they're sitting out here and you're talking to them, you might just bring that cutting board out here and sit down next to them and keep cutting and talk to them. Because that's the side, that's the, where this whole thing boils down to is the relationships that we develop as we work side by side with each other. And so what we found was that doing things like that helped kind of bridge that gap and help bring members into participation um, by trying to make it as easy as possible to participate. Um, and that's part of why also breaking down um, tasks like br making lunch and saying, you can cut carrots, um, this person can fry the bacon, and so on and so forth. That way you're also making it to where it's not overwhelming either, and, but that a member can take on as much or as little as they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Do you have a units on there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do. Yep. Yep, and it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm actually really happy because last time I was here, this was a construction zone, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It was a construction zone for a long time. <laughs> yes, Lara? One of the things that we're developing right now are our unit structures. Mm -hmm. So um, I li I'm like an all or nothing kind of person. I like to go 100 miles an hour and just get it done. So when we first opened, we immediately tried to separate into units, and that's really hard to do when you have like five members coming. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what we ended up doing was um, in the beginning, we had one whiteboard for the entire clubhouse. And our unit meetings were also, it was, they were all combined. So we, um, so we essentially started out with one whiteboard that outlined culinary and business, um, the things that we knew that we needed to get done at that moment. And what that did was it started helping develop the relationships. But then um, when, after we went to um, a couple different clubhouses and looked at some different things, we began identifying that the culinary unit can also do this, the culinary unit can also do this. And we began developing the work order day around what we were identifying that needed to be done. Um, and so as, and so essentially, we, our first split was the culinary unit to the business unit. Um, and then eventually to um, the career and education unit also. So ended up with three different clubhouse units. But it took time. And we did, when we did it too early, the clubhouse um, 
said we don't like this um, we we're going to combine them back and so that was what the clubhouse decided so that's what we did and it, it took about a year to get to a point where we were officially ready to begin holding our own individual unit meetings um, and a lot of that had to do with getting our attendance up a lot of that had to do with um, you know in the afternoons we would have enough members there to have multiple unit meetings in the mornings maybe not so much um, and then other days in the mornings we would have en enough members there to do um, multiple unit meetings and then in the afternoon after lunch everybody disappeared uh, and so it was a touch and go process um, but um, a lot of it that a lot of the success that we found around it actually came from Genesis Club um, for and that's also when we instituted the unit planning meetings to um, be able to have that continued dialogue of developing the work of the clubhouse and what needs to get done or what's not getting done or what work is now identified that we didn't even see six weeks ago that we know needs to get done now um, but it was a way of establishing that dialogue to help build that over here then over here yeah. how do you fund your staff it's great you have so many staff um well So we did have one um, CCO contract that paid for one full-time staff position. Um, everyone else, we um, would just have to try to pull funding from to be able to afford it. Um, so the, the revenue that um, we developed down there, um, this year's, their organizational budget is around a half a million dollars. Um, so usually when you're developing an organizational budget, you identify how many, um, personnel you're going to need so that you can actually um, kind of create what your administrative costs are going to be for or personnel costs for running a clubhouse but then um, the other piece to that is we had also had to develop unique relationships with our county when we first opened so um, two of our first staff were actually not clubhouse staff they were county staff um, from our county mental health provider which is both was good for us and also bad for us because what we immediately ran into was having um, staff from a mental health organization there were policies that that um, the county entity had that rubbed right up against the clubhouse model the first one that comes to mind is evening holidays and weekends um, and so there was issues that came with that but it was needed in the beginning to be able to give us that support and so we found creative ways to try to work around that um, we also toyed with hiring part-time staff which was helpful and also not helpful um, because the part-time staff weren't truly immersed in the clubhouse model um, and the work order day of the clubhouse and so as a result they had struggles with developing relationships and ongoing relationships with members because they weren't consistently there and they weren't consistently a part of the clubhouse and so in time um, what we had to do was build up our overall revenue so that we could insulate and hire our own staff um, and unless you can find direct funding to pay for specific full-time positions it's just going to be a matter of identifying the needs of the clubhouse and then trying to figure out how you can get your revenue and carve out money to be able to pay those individuals um, I wish there was a simple answer to it um, but there, there never is with personnel mm -hmm. yes uh, getting back to the culinary unit uh, there's basically One of the cleanup activities or you know support activities of the of the culinary now as i understand it you made culinary a, a focus on the whiteboard mm -hmm. to make sure that those <coughs> positions were emphasized mm -hmm. and needed to be filled in um, yeah in order for the the meals to take place mm -hmm. is that how you did it yeah so, well um <coughs> So it was a matter of um, identifying the work. We knew that we needed to make lunch, but we also knew that we needed to figure out how to make, make lunch not so overwhelming so that more people can get involved in it. But then at the same time, we also know that we need to wipe down the stainless steel. We have an island just like that. Uh, um, and so we knew that we needed to clean. We knew that we needed to make sure that it looked presentable. And so it was a matter of identifying the work and having a whiteboard where it w that work was listed. And we had both AM and PM things that were to be done in the morning and then in the afternoon. Um, 
And then it was just a matter of emphasizing the importance of that to members. And, you know, our, the culinary unit in most clubhouses that I've been to isn't always, it usually isn't the biggest unit, but it seem, seems to have the most dedicated people in it. <laughs> and, um, and so, like when I was at Alliance House, there was probably about seven members on to, along with the staff that were there that were the ones consistently in there on a daily basis almost um, doing a lot of that work. But then um, when they would run into issues where with getting the dishes done or everything else because there was always a big lunch crowd, the other units would also do announcements of, hey, anybody want to help do dishes after lunch? Um, because usually people would eat and then disappear. Um, I think that's a kind of a common theme. <laughs> um, and so the other units also began recruiting um, to be able to help the culinary unit on something that they knew that was continued to be an issue with helping get the work done. And, and as a result of that, um, at least when I was there for colleague training, there was um, a number of members that would step in and say, I could help do dishes for a little bit. Um, thank you for an awesome lunch. <laughs> and so it was, I think it's going to be tough. You just have to identify it and then internally as a clubhouse, what unique things are going on and how can you guys remedy that or continue discussing that to build awareness around the issue that keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. Always. <laughs> it's so nice in here, I like this. <laughs> Any other questions, you guys? Well, you mentioned evening and weekends. What are the hours down there? Um, so down there, um, the typical business hours are Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, but then um, also um, one evening, uh, the clubhouse had a policy to where they were um, doing one evening recreation thing a week um, on top of any holiday or anything else, any, any other thing going on. So um, like recently they took, they went to a rodeo. <laughs> um, so it's... Um, it varies on different things, but as a clubhouse, we actually had a monthly recreation committee meeting that we would announce that we would post on Facebook and we would hold it at about four o'clock in the evening uh, when we would do it and just have the clubhouse come together to generate ideas for next month's activities and recreation things. What are we going to be doing and who's going to organize those? Um, Lyra, did you have a hand up too? Are you doing Saturday programming? Uh huh. Not every Saturday. Um, so that was something that um, when I was there that I was talking about wanting to get to do. Um, and I know that eventually they will. Um, but with the staffing issues that we were having with transitioning from county staff to clubhouse staff, we hadn't made that jump yet. But we did want to get to a point where we did some Saturday hours. Uh, we were trying out to get to it. So is community adding, is that part of the clubhouse requirement? Um, how so? To get, to get so um, in or for accreditation, and accreditation is not necessarily this make or break thing. They're actually, it's more of a, it's a learning experience for the clubhouse in many cases and doing the self-study and going and meeting with the faculty. Um, but the evening, weekend, and holiday program is emphasized is very important within the clubhouse community because oftentimes those are the times that we're at our most vulnerable. Um, that's why it's, rec it's required that we celebrate the holidays on the days, on the actual holidays themselves. Um, but then also, in a clubhouse, we do so much work together that we also have to learn to play together. And so the recreation piece is increasingly important because, you know, if you are to work at Kaiser Permanente in a certain department, you're probably going to be friends with the people that you're working side by side with. And you might want to go, that group might want to go bowling after work or something else. And so that's there, it's important to be able to recreate together. And um, so it's important as a clubhouse to identify that we have a, we provide these opportunities. So at, 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 down in Southern Oregon, what we ended up doing was we had a monthly planning meeting for that, that we did outside of the work order day. Um, and we would plan out um, the recreation activities and then um, identify the members that wanted to be point people for it and then the execution of those would become part of the work order day um, to be able to get that recreation event going. Bill? Yeah, bringing back to the coalition, uh, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that you're looking for people from North Star to, be to, serve, to serve on the board. 
Mm -hmm. What would that look like for people if they're interested? Well, we've had two board meetings so far, and because we're in different parts of the state, it's um, for me it's a little bit confusing when we're all on the phone together. But um, I would envision um, that it would be a commitment of, at the very least, the meeting each month, but then also helping w through the work within your clubhouse of helping move Clubhouse Oregon along. Um, so if we're talking about um, doing a presentation, then it might be that North Star might be able to take the lead on that or help organize that. And, um, and that can become part of the work that you're doing here in, your, in this clubhouse. So I'd envision probably at the most maybe 10 hours a month um, if, you're, if you're a board member on there. Um, and what I envision more is that your involvement also pulls, pulls North Star more into it to where um, North Star can um, take on that leadership role because eventually what I do envision is that the clubhouses will be in the driver's seat for driving Clubhouse Oregon and the work that we're doing. So you would be the... Um, first members from North Star jumping in and making a change. <laughs> Who's with me? <laughs> I'm kind of fun to hang out with sometimes. <laughs> Anybody? I would love that. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, you know what Bill was talking about with a statewide camp out and things like that, those things are fun. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I love about Clubhouse is the community. Um, from Clubhouse to Clubhouse, when you go to a conference, you see members and staff of other clubhouses, and it's like a f international family. And in, internally within the state of Oregon, we can have the same thing. And I would love to be able to have um, North Star and Compass House have a stronger relationship, or North Star and the startup group in Klamath County have a stronger relationship together to where if you're out traveling and you're, for whatever reason, down in Klamath Falls, you know there's a clubhouse there. Um, you can stop in and say hi, and you're going to know them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, in fact, um, a few months ago, I had a colleague from um, Polaris House up in Juneau, Alaska that was traveling up I-5, stop off at Compass House and say hi. And him and I were in colleague training together, which was neat. Um, but was, what was also awesome is I never get the chance to see him like that, so I also got to give him a tour. And, you know, that sense of community to me is the most cool thing about Clubhouse is that we all get to be, on the, be in, here with the same mission and the same directive of helping people move forward with their lives. And we get to have friendships on top of it. Um, you know, when I worked in addiction treatment, I wasn't allowed to have clients on my Facebook or anything. And I have Clubhouse members all over my Facebook page. Um, and I love that because I get to have real meaningful relationships. Um, mind you, I do have boundaries, um, as do they. But at the same time, it's, um, it's real. Um, it's an actual collegial relationship that doesn't exist in other areas in the mental health field. And to me, that's what's needed. It Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Can I keep this? I really like having this. <laughs> That was me. <laughs> Did you send that to um, our staff, or would you mind doing that? I would I'd love like to do to that. I would love to. Thank you. Yep. <sighs> you know, um, if if it has to do with me and the word "amazing" is used, I'm taking credit for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, so yesterday I um, presented on the clubhouse model in front of the Oregon Consumer Advisory Council in Salem. So um, this sequence of meetings actually worked out perfectly because I was already in Salem. So happy to be here. All right. Thank you.
If you like this video and want to support Northstar, please go to northstarclubhouse.org and click donate.